Hello, and welcome to the Czech Rare Podcast. My name is Peter Suzuki, and the topic of today's discussion is Fabre disease, a rare inherited lysosomal disorder that affects many organs, including the heart, kidney, and nervous system. It is a progressive, lifelong condition. In this episode, we will be talking with Maya Kinnan, a patient and advocate with this rare disorder. Hello, Maya. Thank you for your time today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, my name is Maya. I'm a 22-year-old college student located um, in a small town a little bit north of Philadelphia. I am currently a psych major at a local community college, and I work as a nanny as well. I live with my parents and my younger brother, and my mom, I've always seen her be an advocate for uh, Fabry disease patients, and so I hope to continue her her trend. Great. I'm sure you will. Tell us, when did you first learn about Fabry disease? Was it with your diagnosis? Was Was your family aware of this disease beforehand? My grandfather was first diagnosed with Fabry in 1984. Um, well, my mom was 14. My family has known for a long time, longer than most families with Fabre. They, he was able to get a very early diagnosis because my family very much pushed for that and several other opinions of doctors to make sure that he had a proper diagnosis. So I've always been aware of what Fabre was in my life from pretty much as long as I can remember. Uh, my family has always been very open about it especially because there was a 50% chance that I would be inheriting the disease. I was diagnosed when I was 10, officially, but I had already been experiencing symptoms beforehand. I have known for a very, very long time. Yeah, so I guess your diagnostic journey is a little bit different from what we normally hear, where patients aren't familiar with this disease and bop around. You kind of knew. What was it that got you to get tested? My parents have always, you know, pushed being proactive with my my health, making sure I take care of myself. And neither of them, you know, hid the fact that I most likely had this disease. I actually started experiencing some symptoms in elementary school. Um, so when I was very young, um, that kind of pushed the official diagnosis, was experiencing early onset symptoms. Can you talk a little bit about your family members who, who have Fabry disease? Yeah, so I, I have a large family. Uh, my mom is the youngest of six siblings. Fabry disease was diagnosed on her side of the family, my grandfather, and his four daughters were all diagnosed. So I have a few aunts, and then they each had kids, and five of us, I think, five of us um, in my generation that have Fabry. Um, so everyone in the family is very, like, everyone knows, everyone's very educated about it. Uh, like there are multiple of us within the same family that we lean on each other and support each other. What could be improved for diagnosis for this rare disease? Spreading awareness, just networking and spreading awareness is huge, especially to phys physicians, people that are going to be making these diagnoses. And What are some of the biggest challenges living with Fabre disease? Well, it's an invisible disease. A lot of my advocating is in my daily life. When I tell people that I'm, I have a chronic illness, that I have a, like a disability, they don't believe me or um, seen as using it for attention or an excuse. Think that not being visibly ill definitely comes with a lot of challenges day to day, because people think that you're feeling totally fine a hundred percent when you are experiencing daily pain and symptoms that make it much more difficult than the average person. And are there any symptoms that are burdensome for, for, for a patient to carry through day, day to day? So I would say if you ask the Fabry patient, are you in pain? Nine days out of 10, they're going to say yes. Something is hurting. Um, it's more often not the question of are you in pain, just how much pain are you in today? Specifically, I deal with a lot of uh, migraines and headaches and fatigue. And I also get a lot of neuropathic pain, which can be very difficult because I enjoy being active. And um, I'm a nanny to young kids and I'm also in school. So I have a busy schedule and being more fatigued than others, being 
not at a hundred percent all the time definitely makes it harder to keep keep up with my peers. Maya, what do you do to, to manage these symptoms, the headaches and the pain? And so luckily, I've been able to be on treatment um, since I was first diagnosed. So I started treatment at 10 years old. I mean, I don't really know um, because I don't really have anything else to base it off. But I would say that it has helped me lessen symptoms that would have been worsen, worsening over the years. Um, so I have always been able to keep up with treatment. Um, I've had tried a few different forms, which is nice. And just taking care of yourself and being aware of where your body is at the moment and not pushing yourself. I think being aware that you do have these limitations is extremely important in taking care of yourself. What's a typical week like for you? And how does Fabre kind of work into that? Yeah, like I said, I'm I'm been pretty busy. I work as a nanny to a two and a four year old three, four days a week. And I have classes Tuesdays and Thursdays all day. I'm kind of crammed in everything on those days. So I'd still have time to work. I would say that, especially now, like February impacts my ability to do things after I get done the week. I, I feel like I put a lot of my energy towards just surviving the week. And then the weekend is, is often a recovery process. I definitely value my sleep a lot more than others. I often go to bed earlier than a lot of my friends. Hydration is huge to me, especially with my my headaches. I'm very on top of that throughout the week. I have to be very consistent. What doctor specialties are you seeing and how does that communication work? You pick one doctor to be the point person or are you the point person? I would say a lot of it does come from advocating for yourself. Uh, the networking in the first place kind of has to be done by yourself as a patient. But yearly, I would see nephrology, cardiology, I see audiology, orthopedics, but I for joint issues, at least four or five doctors a year. And I also, my main Fabry specialist is a metabolics specialist as well. He kind of is my point person as well in helping me coordinate and find the proper specialist that will be able to help me. Do you find when you work with your doctors or if a new doctor or healthcare provider is introduced, you have to educate them on Fabry disease? Oh yeah, definitely. I would say that that has happened a few times um, in the past. I, I remember one particular time at an urgent care and he saw it in my chart and he was definitely faking it that he knew what it was. And so it can be hard as like a patient, especially like a young patient, to correct a physician. But there have been multiple times where I've been like, I don't think you know what Fabre is, which is okay. It's extremely rare, but I would rather the physician ask. What would you like healthcare providers and people to know about Fabre that maybe they don't know? Listen to the patients more. I think that patients have a much better understanding of their body and how the disease works for them than physicians realize. Um, Fabry is such a diverse disease, like symptoms vary from person to person, even within a family. And I think that taking the time to really listen to the patient is top priority. You said that you were diagnosed early, very aware, you started treatment at, at 10. Tell us about that transition you know, now that you're an adult, what were the care needs like when you were first diagnosed and started treatment to now? I was a very timid child in a lot of ways. So I started off with the infusions and I remember being very nervous, but my situation is unique because I have family members that already have gone through um, diagnosis, all of that. So I was lucky enough to have a lot of support um, when I was first going in, even I was like very nervous, but I still had a lot of information about what I was going into, which was very helpful. Now I'm on an oral medication. It definitely has changed my schedule a lot. I'm not um, hooked up to an IV every two weeks for several hours, which is, I think, important to me as an adult that I have more flexibility in my schedule to take care of my responsibilities. Did you find your doctors changed from when you were 
10 to now, like the types of specialists that you interact with? Yeah, I've always been pretty fortunate to have a lot of great specialists. I've, I can't really think of an experience that stood out as particularly bad. I've mostly been with uh, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia my entire Fabry journey. And they're a wonderful network with a lot of the same specialists for several years, which is nice. Um, but again, now I have to work on transitioning to adult specialists. What advice would you give to a new, newly diagnosed patient or family of Fabry disease? Get connected. Find the community. Make sure you have that village on your side because that support and that connections and networking is super important. Educating yourself is a powerful tool. I think that's the best thing that you can do as a patient is just getting involved and educating yourself because you are your, your, your best advocate. And what are some of the organizations that you would recommend? The FSIG organization is wonderful when it comes to networking with other patients. Honestly, like a lot of the pharmaceutical meetings in the areas and stuff like my mom was able to go to the world conference and was a patient advocate there and she was able to spread awareness and network with other people what about mental health is that something that impacts people living with Fabry disease oh absolutely um, i'm a huge proponent for mental health uh, taking care of your mental health anyone with a chronic illness is it's going to affect your mental health your daily life is different and that's going to affect how you perceive the world and how your mind works. I'm a psychology major. I'm, I'm, I would like to be a pediatric therapist. And so mental health is very important to me. And especially as someone with a chronic illness, my mental health has definitely been impacted by Fabre. I think that needs to be talked about when we talk about Fabre disease and the symptoms. So I would say a lot of people with chronic illnesses in general experience a lot of depression and anxiety surrounding their diagnosis. To be chronically ill and knowing that there's no cure, it can be very difficult on your mental well-being. There are a lot of extra obstacles that we face as people with chronic illnesses, and that can wear down on your mental health as well. I'd say it causes a lot of anxiety just trying to juggle with day-to-day -day life, depression, because your body hurts a lot, you're in pain a lot, and that is going to affect your mental state. Maya, how do you stay so strong? How do you deal with this? Because you seem to be doing it pretty well. Thank you. I appreciate that. Again, everyone looks different on the outside than how they feel on the inside. I struggle with a lot. I've been seeing a therapist for about five years now, someone who specializes actually in chronic illness, because my mental health has definitely been affected by it. I'm lucky to have a great support system, honestly. I, my family, having advocates in the family already and just, just wonderful supporters in general is super helpful. To keep myself going, I also need to recognize my limitations. I am 22, but I very rarely stay up late or go out because I need to be aware that sometimes my body just can't handle that. So if I want to do day-to-day -day things, I have to be on top of myself and on, on top of my own health and aware of what's going on. Our disease doesn't define us. I think it's a, an important aspect of who we are, but I'm so much more than Fabre. And at the same time, I appreciate people listening to me spreading awareness about the disease. So I think it's important for both patients and people related to patients to understand that, yes, Fabry is a part of life, but it does not define them. And they're still their own individual who can do great. You've got a great story, Maya. I'm in awe of your advocacy and the work that you're doing and, you know, to talk about it and to educate others, because that's the big part of this podcast is to educate others. I was looking um, through your guys' website and I appreciate the advocacy that you guys do, um, not only for the physical part, but the mental health side as well. Thank you, Maya, for your time today and for your insight into Fabray disease and for letting us know what it's like to be living with this rare disorder.